All right. Well, hello, everyone. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. I'm not exactly a seasoned live stream pro. I suppose I've been doing it for a while now, but I don't do it all that often. I see some thumbs up. Hopefully that means that you can, in fact, hear me. Well, today I'm going to be doing just a little bit of an impromptu live q and I think uh, if you looked at the description of this video, it's pretty accurate. Maybe I'll change it in the future uh, to include all the good intro stuff that you're supposed to put in there. But basically the story is uh, Eliza's away for the weekend. I had to write a final paper, but I finished it a little earlier than I thought. So I thought, why not do a live Q&A? These are really fun for me to do. It puts me on my toes and it seems like you all enjoy them. So... I've had some patrons submit some questions. I've got lots of questions on my YouTube community page, uh, but also feel free to put questions in the live chat there. And if you're so inclined, you can do a super chat and I'll make sure to get to it. But first to my patrons, if you're not familiar with my Patreon, it's patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. And a huge thank you to all those people who support the channel, whether from $5 a month, $50 a month, or something crazy like that. Um, there's a lot of fun perks of being a patron too. Just a real quick plug for that. We do a bi-weekly book club. We're currently going through the Apostolic Fathers. Um, we're almost done it. And so it's just a really fun time getting to read through the, the original sources with people from all across the country, sometimes even across the world, um, from different traditions. And so I really enjoy that. If you're interested, patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. Plug over. Okay. So uh, real quick, um, chess player asked, what was the paper on? The paper was on uh, Providence in the Direction of History. It was a bit of a survey of four authors, uh, St. Augustine, Jean-Baptiste Vico, he's kind of like a Renaissance Italian philosopher, uh, Hegel, and Kant. Uh, so really fun stuff there, talking about the role of Providence in history. Are, is history a steady progression of progress um, towards some type of more like enlightened uh, state? Is it cyclical? Is it something in between? So fun stuff there. Happy to talk more about it if you'd like. So uh, just two questions from Patreon that I'm seeing right now, and then we'll get into some more of the uh, the chat stuff. The first is from uh, a guy you might might have heard of. He's got this small... You, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's soon going to overpass mine. I think uh, when his channel passes mine subscribers, uh, we should throw a party because I'm just so excited for him, uh, genuinely. And that is Gavin Ortland. And I think I've said this before, but it just tells you the kind of guy he is, that he's a patron of my channel. And he says, many people I slash we know struggle with ecclesial anxiety, by which I mean a deep fear of being in the wrong church that can even become crippling. Based on your own experiences exploring ecumenical questions, what pastoral or practical counsel would you give them? Bonus points if your answer uh, includes Anselm, Irenicism, or C.S. Lewis. Well, I must admit that I know very little about Anselm, so you have to go to Dr. Ortland's channel, Truth Unites, for that. Um, but uh, so I think this is a really good question. And basically, what do you do with that anxiety? And it really is like this existential angst that I've felt, that many have felt, when you begin to ask these questions and you go like, how do I know if I'm in the right church? How do I even know what the right church is? And I think, you know, in some ways, my channel might exasperate that for some people because, you know, the, the great strength of my channel, I think, is that it brings people from across the Christian tradition who are some of the best representatives of those traditions to present that tradition to you. That's wonderful. The problem with my channel is that it brings the best and smartest people from all of these different traditions because then you realize that there's people smarter than you in each of these traditions. And you wonder, how on earth could I ever get to the bottom of this? If that's where you are, you are not alone. Okay, so how have I uh, done this and what advice would I have for people? So I definitely have experienced that sense of angst. I'd say it probably hit like a, a fever pitch in college. And some of that was by my own doing. And so I think I became in some ways too cocooned into this. And what I mean by that is, so I was studying theology, which is a great thing, but it's a peculiar thing when all your time spent with this, right? So it was already a question there. But then I was running this YouTube channel as kind of my part-time job in college. And so all of my thinking in the part-time job was also on these questions. And then my friend group became a group of people that were all interested in these questions. So literally from like sun up to sundown, I was asking the question of what is the true church and where is it and what should we do about it and how do we know it? And as, poor, as important as these questions are, when they begin to kind of impede in your ability to just function or even in your relationship with God, when it becomes kind of a barrier and you can't, can't focus and you're so in your head that you struggle to worship or engage with your church, I think sometimes you just need to breathe and slow down 
you know, some of the greatest advice I've gotten in this journey is that God is not in a hurry and that God has space for us in this. And I think what's been helpful for me is coming back to the question that I ask every one of my guests, and that is, what is the gospel? Coming back to the nature of God. And and this is probably going to reveal some of my own kind of Protestant biases, but when I think about the gospel, when I think about what scripture says about coming into union with Christ, coming into right standing with God, all of these things, what it means to be saved— I don't see that question wrapped up in what church you belong to. Now, I know that there are people who disagree with me on that. And that very disagreement, I know, can cause people anxiety. But if you can really focus back on the fundamental question of of who is God, what is the character of God, and how does one come into relationship with him? How is one saved? I think that can really bring what Gavin, it wasn't one of the bonus words, but uh, gospel assurance in that way, that I think it really can be something that can can be settling and recognizing that theology is really important and figuring out the, the nature of the church is really important. But even more fundamental than that is the question of, of who is God? How do I relate to God? And, and what must I do in, in that way? And I think when you can rest on that, when you can rest on the good news of the gospel, that, that God sent his son to heal humanity from the inside out by becoming man, by dying on the cross for us, that we might live in him and rising from the dead, that we might have that hope of resurrection life as well. Like, I think when you can focus on that and really rest in the beauty of the gospel, you can just have a little more peace with some of these questions. So I hope that's helpful. For my bonus mention of C.S. Lewis, at least, I will say, my conception of the church over time has changed. And so when I think about the church, I, one of the biggest questions I ask myself is, how do evangelicals, because that's the background I come from, fit within the church? And, and C.S. Lewis uses this uh, idea of like a hall with many rooms. And, and I use something similar. Um, and I often think of like evangelicals. So are evangelicals a different house? Are they the house? Are they one of the rooms? Like how, how does that work? And, and I tend to think that the church is a very big house with very, very many rooms. Um, and, and I often look at evangelicals as almost like the people standing in the entryway, the people that are welcoming people and the people that are working at the front lines that, in kind of the foyer there. And I think it's a beautiful place. I think it's a place that, that is filled with mission, that is filled with um, with a burning heart to see people enter those doors. And, and so as I b- look further and further at the church, I, I sense, you know, is it? it's not so much a question of, will I be leaving one building for another, but would I be leaving one part for a different part? Not because one part is inherently bad, but maybe going further up and further in or in a different place is where I can do more good for the gospel or maybe has a a greater fullness of the truth. Like, I think those questions are fair, but um, I've just seen these things as interconnected parts. And so there's the bonus C.S. Lewis mentioned. Okay, Uh, just one more question from Patreon and then I'll get to some Patreon, uh, some questions in the chat as well as uh, from the YouTube community tab there. There was two uh, from a patron named Hope and she asks, uh, she says, I've been wondering very much about these verses, John 6, 53 to 63. After a super long dialogue on why those who follow Jesus must truly eat his flesh and drink his blood, he says in verse 63 that his words are spirit, the flesh profits nothing. What do you think this means regarding the Eucharist? Okay, so um. I've found the the Church Fathers really helpful on this. I believe it's uh, Chrysostom, I think, here. Um, uh, I could pull up Logos and see. But, you know, they wrestle through these questions, and they say, okay, so what can it mean that the flesh profits nothing? Well, surely it can't mean that the flesh of Christ profits nothing, right? And I think theologically, we'd have to say, oh, well, of course not. The flesh of Christ, like, the the incarnation and, and the, the dying of Christ, like, all of us agree that 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 flesh certainly profits something. I tend to think that what Christ is getting at there at the end, um, when he says that the flesh profits nothing, is that it's more of like a fleshly way of understanding things, uh, because he's asking the disciples, like, does this offend you? Um, And they say, you know, to to whom shall we go? Uh, All of that, right? But he says, is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. I tend to think of that as more of like a way of understanding than the idea that things don't matter, because I think that takes you down some theological paths that really no one wants to go down. Um, Well, some people might. I've been reading too much Hegel. I digress. Um, I believe she had a second question. She says, 
Uh, I also wonder what is a schism. If all churches are acceptable by God that believe in the gospel, what is a schism? Okay, so I think this is a great question. It comes down to kind of the uh, visible and invisible church. So I think I want to say that everyone would agree, at least with this conception, in some ways. Now, I know that some people kind of uh, have a knee-jerk reaction against this Protestant understanding. They uh, think that the idea that there's only an invisible church is wrong, that the visible church matters uh, and I think that's a fair thing to be upset about, but I just don't think that's what Protestantism classically has taught. So when uh, hope, when you say that uh, if all churches are acceptable to God that believe in the gospel, what is a schism? So I think one, I mean, schism, schism has to do with the visible church, right? Like these institutions, when they are no longer in communion with one another, by definition, there's a schism there because they're separated, right? So that's what we have in schism, like a break. Um, I think you're asking, but is that, is it not still the case that if they are both believing the gospel, that that's okay and that it's not a real schism? I think that's, you know, maybe true on like a spiritual level, right? That all who are united to Christ are thus united to the church, right? Because the church is Christ's body. So if you are united to Christ, you are united to the church. And then even if you were in kind of um, visible churches that were separated, in some, in a spiritual sense or in a mystical sense, you are still united as people because you are united to Christ, who is the head of the church. Okay, great. Um, but I do still think that schism is essentially just the, the visible church being torn asunder by disagreements that uh, cause a lack of communion between churches. Okay, so now let me check the chat. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, let me know if there's any any issues. Um, okay. Is this an EO channel? Uh, by EO, I assume the person means Eastern Orthodox. The answer to that would be, I mean, no, insofar as I'm not Eastern Orthodox. Um, the, the funny thing I get, so I'll get comments that like you only interview Orthodox or you only interview Catholics. And I think some of that's just kind of like a self-selection of the YouTube algorithm insofar as if you are into Eastern Orthodox videos, the channel will show you Eastern Orthodox content. Um, my content, that's Eastern Orthodox. If you're into Catholic content, it will show you Catholic content because that's what it thinks will keep you on the platform and watch more ads and make it more money. Yay for YouTube. Um, so I, the funny thing is like, if you actually look at my channel, it's really pretty close to a even split between Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. I try to do that fairly intentionally. So no, it, it's not an Eastern Orthodox channel, though I love interviewing Eastern Orthodox guests and I think there's a lot to learn from them. Uh, what was the paper on? Yes, talked about that. Um, JT posted in another, okay, I'm not seeing it yet. Um, people said, hello, hello. Um, all right. So, oh, people had already answered that question. Oh, and shout out to, um, shout out to Jim for the formatting. So a formatting note here. If you put Q at the beginning of your question, that makes it easier for me to tell if you're talking to other people in the chat or if you're in fact asking me a question that you would like me to answer. So thanks, Jim, for putting the cue. You're a real YouTube star. Okay. As one digs more into theology, does one still find gospel simplicity or is it more complex now? Great question. I think it is something of a cycle in a way. So, and I think this is true with any discipline that um, you go from, oh, and there's a great kind of like, quadrant for this. I can't think of it um, off the top of my head, but basically uh, realizing that you don't know anything, learning a little and thinking that you know, uh, learning enough to realize that you don't know much, and then learning enough to know that you know what you know. Uh, that's a really terrible way of putting it. I wish I could think of how it's supposed to go. I'm sure someone can put it in the chat because this is like a business framework or like it's like a thinking, a knowledge framework uh, that comes up in business. Anyway, so as one digs into theology, I think it's something like that. At the beginning, you think theology is really simple, right? Because you, at least in an evangelical context, you know, it, whoever confesses uh, with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart will be saved. And it's like, simple. Like, what more could you need? And then you dig deeper and you ask questions about like, well, well what does belief mean? What does it mean to confess? And what does it mean to be saved, right? Um, you start kind of questioning what, what these words mean and things get complex. And then you dive in, you realize just how much there is in theology, right? And, and it gets complicated. I see a similar thing happen to like, um, when I was in Bible college, you would see a freshman come in, right? And after freshman year, they've done their survey courses and they think they know everything. Um, but the problem is they don't know enough at that point to realize that they barely know anything 
about anything, right? They just know a couple categories and they think they know a lot. Um, and so as you go, then you realize, whoa, there is layers to all these questions and it feels really complex. Um, and then you begin to, to dive deeper and you're able to hopefully systematize things. You're able to see kind of like coherence between ideas. You're able to grasp them in a better way. You can see how ideas relate to each other and all of a sudden maybe things start to get a little more simplified for you. Um, but so that's to say, um, I often find theology complex. I think theology is by nature uh, difficult in a lot of ways, but that the goal is to see the inner coherence of it. And also the name kind of comes from this idea of taking complex ideas, complex historical debates, complex theological debates, and hopefully making them a little easier to understand. Um, so I, I would say that um, theology is complex. I, I do still think that the, the gospel is fundamentally pretty simple. Um, and I think it behooves those of us of theological and philosophical mindsets to remember that, which is why I like to bring it back to that. Great question there, Jim. Um, okay. Um, some, some questions in here. Um, okay. I can get into this, um, because I talked about this a little in a last stream. I won't take too much time on it. Uh, but because you said, please, in all caps, I... I feel obligated. Um, so A. Bex says, can you please discuss where you're at on veneration and iconography? I wouldn't have a problem with it if it wasn't made such a big issue in Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Okay, so great question. Um, so I've gone on the record before saying that I, my basic position on this is that uh, the veneration of icons is a theological development. Um, I, I don't tend to think it's an apostolic practice. Um, insofar as like, I don't think the apostles venerated icons, but I think it is a valid theological development. So in that way, you can maybe put my, my stance, uh, between someone like a Gavin Ortland and, you know, your run of the mill Eastern Orthodox or Catholic insofar as I would agree with Dr. Gavin Ortland and for the record, like a whole lot of scholars, he's not crazy for thinking of this, um, that veneration of icons is a development, um, that, that it's, not, it's something that arises later in the tradition. Okay. Um, but I would also say that it's a theologically valid development. So that I, I do think that the, ar the theological arguments that people like St. John of Damascus produce um, on the role of the incarnation and allowing us to uh, depict Christ and that also that when we venerate an icon, um, that that honor paid to the icon passes through to uh, the prototype. I think that... I guess where I'd nuance my position is that I think um, something can be theologically licit, uh, like theologically allowed, but maybe pastorally impractical, or maybe not impractical is the word, but um, that can be sensitive pastorally. So what I mean by this is that I think if you have a proper understanding of the theology of the veneration of icons, if you're, un if you're understanding all of that, uh, that, that thinking, right? That you could say, yes, I, you know, I could kiss this icon in a way that I would kiss a picture of my wife, um, which is showing my devotion, not, not to the picture, but, but to my wife. Wonderful. The problem, I think, is that people don't always have this understanding, and the practice could easily lapse into something that, if not idolatry, is certainly theologically specious, let's say. Let's say so. I think it's important to to teach well on this and that people understand it. I would never require someone to venerate icons, although I think when when Protestants get kind of wrapped up in the the requirement to do so, I think we have to understand also just like kind of the ecclesial context that some of these debates arise out of. Insofar as when someone is telling you that what you're doing is idolatry, and you say no, you can't say that. Like, you're not allowed to say that because it's, it's fracturing the church, it's not working, and we believe it's true. Um, that in that context, I could get where it arises where you say, like, no, like, we, we should venerate icons, and anyone who says we can't is outside the bounds of what's happening here. I wouldn't attach an anathema to it. I would simply say that, you know, like, belonging in this church, it's not going to be functional if you say we, you can't, and we say you can, and you're saying we're, you know, idolaters, and we're saying we're not. That, that's not going to functionally work. Um, I wish there weren't anathemas attached to it insofar as anathema um, at the way they're defining it the second uh, council of nicaea there uh, seems to have soteriological implications big words lots of things um hopefully that's helpful feel free to ask follow-up questions 
I feel like I always talk way faster when I'm on a live Q&A. I channel my inner Gregory Pine, so feel free to tell me to slow down. Um, okay, I want to pull a couple from uh, the YouTube community page real quick, just because I know there's a couple good ones. And one that um, I told someone I would answer was from, oh, it was from Chess Player. You're in the chat. Well, Chess Player, um, I'm answering your question over here on this screen, but you're on that screen. You don't know any of that. You're in the video. Anyway, I digress. Okay, what do you think the proper role of philosophy is in the Christian church? What a great question. So this past week, I was in New York City for a work training. Spoiler alert, this is not my full-time job. Um, I've got a real full-time job. So I, I was in New York City, and I was meeting up with a, a coworker of mine, and I did something I very rarely do because I am in, I don't particularly like alcohol, um, but I'll drink occasionally. And so he said, hey, you want to go to a happy hour and chat? So we chatted. Didn't even know that he was uh, all that interested in faith, but somehow he gets into asking me how it is that I'm doing a master's with a focus in philosophy and theology, because he says, after all, philosophy is all about like doubt and skepticism and disproving God, and theology is all about experiencing God personally. So how do those things go together? I thought, how fascinating, uh, because for most of Christian history, Philosophy is kind of like the handmaiden of theology, that philosophy teaches us how to think well. It gives us that, those faculties to, to reason properly. And when we apply that to theology, it helps us do theology better. So essentially, that's how I think of the relationship of philosophy uh, in the Christian church. I think philosophy is actually really helpful. I think it teaches us how to think clearly. That's what philosophy should do. Um, and so I don't think we should have philosophy be the, the driver right? So I think we can at times become so enamored with philosophy that we lose sight of theology. I think that can be bad, but I think insofar as we come to these questions in the text that are difficult, we say, how do we kind of bring together this idea that God is, you know, fully human and fully divine, and then we have these things like the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union does not get off the ground without theology or without philosophy. It just doesn't. Like, you need some of these Greek categories to start working with you, and right, something like transubstantiation. Some people might say that goes too far, we could debate that, but insofar as if you have this belief that Christ is present in the Eucharist, but it still tastes like bread, still looks like bread, you're going to need to employ philosophy to be able to try to wrestle through that question, right? Um, so I, I think philosophy is actually really good. I tend to think uh, now with my master's being more focused on philosophy um, or having a heavy focus on philosophy, doing a lot of reading in it, I tend to think that my evangelical undergraduate degree was kind of woefully short on philosophy, that we, of course, had philosophy going on in the background because you can't really do theology without having some philosophical um, bases going on, but we, we didn't know what they were. And I think that's a dangerous thing when you don't understand that the way I'm thinking isn't just like the default, but I actually have philosophical assumptions here. And so I think, um, yeah, my evangelical training didn't have nearly enough philosophy in it, and I'm glad to get to try to catch up on that a little bit now. Okay, that was one of my favorite questions from that oh there's another question um yeah oh this person's in the chat too you guys are just you're awesome uh j terp i think it was so um j terp says i know everyone seems to ask you why you didn't become roman or orthodox but why not consider becoming anglican especially more of an anglo-catholic type you'll have few if any problems you've stated with rome and the east and much if not all the benefits of both including apostolic succession, real presence, Eucharist, icons, statues, and much more. So this is a great question. It's one I get a lot. Why haven't you become Anglican or why haven't you become Lutheran? Quick water break. Okay. So to start this question, I want to say that I have a great deal of respect for both Anglicans and Lutherans. I know this question is specifically um, Luther or Anglican, though, so I'll stick with that. Um, the main reason I haven't become Anglican is kind of, I guess there's two. Um, I'll say fundamentally, I look at something like becoming Anglican or Lutheran for that matter. as fundamentally different than becoming Catholic or Orthodox. Why is that? Because I don't see Anglicans, um, making an exclusive claim to being the one true church. So, uh, because they view me differently in that way, uh, that, you know, I'm already part of, uh, the church that I would say it would really be more of a matter of preference. So it wouldn't be a matter of necessity. It's not like I'm convinced that this is the only option and therefore I must become this. Um, rather, I could think that this is a good option. 
And I will say that I actually do think becoming Anglican, especially, I would say probably, um, is a really good option. Like I attended an Anglican church a little bit when I was in college and I love, uh, the Anglican liturgy. There's a lot I really like about the Anglican church. Um, and like you said, Anglo, Anglo Catholic churches, I think, you know, have a lot of the, the things that I look for without a lot of the drawbacks. So why wouldn't I do that? Um, well, one is there's not like a really convenient, okay, that, I mean, this is kind of lame, right? I know a lot of you drive a lot for, to church than I do, but there's not like an Anglo, Anglican uh, church or Anglo Catholic church, like super close nearby. Uh, maybe, I guess, if I wanted to drive into Baltimore, um, there's actually a great one in Baltimore. But so, you know, there's a convenience factor. Um, I'll also say that generally speaking, uh, my wife prefers more of a contemporary service um, that really connects with, with the music in that. And so I would say that it would it would be difficult for me to try to like yank her out of the church context that we're in, that we both really enjoy, that we have great friends at, that, uh, you know, has great gospel preaching, that has great community, um, that is really on fire for the, the Great Commission, that is seeing people baptized so often and like it's doing amazing work. It'd be hard for me to pull that, her away from that just because like, I preferentially prefer, um, you know, a higher liturgy. I, I would like some incense or something like that. To do that, I would have to be more convinced, like, this is a necessity. And if I was convinced of uh, Catholicism or Orthodoxy, it would be a necessity, at least for me. I wouldn't make her go. Um, but I hope that's helpful. So, um, like, if I was a single guy living in a big city where I could, you know, walk to an Anglo-Catholic church, that's probably what I'd go to. Um, but I do find that being in the context that I'm in, in a more evangelical setting, it kind of offsets some of my preferences. Like, if it was my preference, I would sit in the back of a liturgical church, and I would love it. I just, no no one would ask me to do anything. Like, I, I started on, on staff at a church when I was 18. I've been volunteering in churches since I was in fifth grade. Um, and this YouTube channel. So, you know, I've had to, in some ways, work through my own necessity to, um, to kind of measure my faith and my, uh, like value of being good at doing things. And so sometimes, you know, I really look for an opportunity to just kind of sit back. I think it's important to serve and I do serve. Um, but you know, if it was just my flesh, I would go to an Anglican church, I'd sit in the back, no one would bother me, it'd be beautiful and it'd be great. Um, but by going to kind of a lower church, um, thing where I serve in the kids ministry, where they're always challenging me to be, you know, focused on the Great Commission, to be focused on the mission of God, to to make disciples, to live out my faith, you know, it, it takes me away from my life of the mind, um, but it, it challenges me in good ways. So that was a long answer. Hopefully that's helpful. I need more water. Okay. Again, if you put Q, um, that's helpful. So I'm going back to the chat here. Um, great question. The Bean Wilkins says, have you read Tolkien or C.S. Lewis? What are your favorite works among them? Uh, so bonus points for anyone that can surmise the books that are behind me. Um, but I'll tell you that these are the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so that's, that's a box set by J.R.R. Tolkien. And they are not just uh, background art. I've actually read them. Uh, so yeah, I, I've read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Um, I've read a little bit uh, of The Silmarillion. Um, you know, I've read the kind of like creation story in there, which I think is beautiful. Um, so yeah, I uh, I enjoy Tolkien. I'm not as deep in Tolkien as a lot of people are, um, but I think Tolkien's great. C.S. Lewis. Um, next bonus point next to Tolkien is The Chronicles of Narnia. Um, so now you guys are learning it bonus points. So there's three, uh, so there's another box set here. Then there's something here and here. It's really hard to point when it's mirrored like that. Uh, put it in the chat if you know what they are, but, um, yeah. So reread Narnia recently. So good. Um, I've read a lot of the rest of Lewis. Um, it's honestly probably easier. I don't say this like in an arrogant way, but, uh, to, to name the works I haven't read by him. Um, one, one I haven't though, is his, uh, like his sci-fi trilogy, which I, my wife and I are hoping to listen to together. We often, uh, listen to fiction together. And so I'd like to do that. I think Lewis is awesome. Um, yeah, I think he's great. Um, I read mere Christianity at a pretty pivotal time in my, my faith journey. Um, yeah, 
all good things to say about both of them. Okay. The other Caleb said contemporary worship is based. I don't know if it's sarcasm or not. Just because the, like, if we were to Venn diagram, the people I know that use the word based, and the people I know that say, that like contemporary worship, like, the overlap would be very small. But if it's not sarcasm, cool. Um, if it is sarcasm, so be it. Um, yeah. It, it was, like, months of being on YouTube and hearing people use the word based before I had any idea what it meant. Um, but, okay. The Wheeling Dragon says, hi, finally catching a live. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. I'll be honest, um, Eliza was just telling me that I have issues. Um, so Eliza's away, and uh, when, when she's away, I generally lapse into my workaholic nature. So I did an in-person interview today, which I think was one of my best. I can't wait for you guys to see it. In-person interviews are so much fun, and it was wonderful. Um, but I did an in-person interview today. I just recorded a video uh, on BART and whether theology is a science. It's a pretty rough video. I don't even know if I'll post it. I need to listen back through it. Um, I wrote a term paper today. Now I'm doing this. So I tend to really overwork when left to my own devices. So I'm a little tired. I was traveling all week for work, but I'm doing well. I really enjoy doing this kind of thing and I'm grateful to get to do it. So thanks for asking, the Wheeling Dragon. Okay. Um, questions in the chat. This is spicy. Uh, Czar Nicholas II asked, what is my opinion on the Russia-Ukraine war? Um, I actually don't have any really good opinions to share other than the fact that I really don't like war. I know that's like the least nuanced take ever. Um, but I just have this like knee jerk. Like, I don't like war. Um, and I think it's, it's quite sad. Um, but I'm not educated enough really. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. The other Caleb was being serious. He said, as a drummer especially, he likes contemporary worship. Cool. Um, as you'll often see in my videos, I play guitar. Played guitar at non-denominational churches for a while. Don't currently. Um, bonus points if you notice that the Strat is gone. Because we're moving and it's packed up. Um, but as someone said, post it in all caps about the BART video. So yeah, what could go wrong? Uh, in the BART video, I accident I pick up the book that's closest to my desk. I, I was making like an illustration, like gravity. Do I, you know, how do we test something? And so I drop my phone and then I grab a book. I'm like, in fact, drop this. And it was Karl Marx. And I was like, don't judge me. It's for class. Um, but people will probably get a kick out of the fact that Marx was the closest book uh, nearby. But on this stack, the closest book would be An Apology of the Church of England by John Jewell. So there you go quite different okay um oh thanks uh the bean willikin says just want to say your room looks awesome love the lighting and bookshelves thank you the good news is that i think it's about to get even better because eliza and i recently bought a house and we'll be moving soon yay house exciting uh just paint well i didn't actually paint it my mom came and did it because she's the best um but painted the studio got some cool ideas for it so i think it's gonna be really neat I hope you guys like it. And when I say studio, I mean a small guest bedroom um, that I'm commandeering for my own purposes. Okay. Sacramento Today. That sounds like a uh, like news organization, like a newspaper. Those still exist. A couple. Um, what are your thoughts on the Apocrypha? Do you believe those books are should be in the Bible? Okay, so I just recently did a couple videos on this. I had... Uh, who was it? Steve Christie, Gary Mashuda, a couple other videos, uh, but those are the two main ones. Uh, and they were great. I uh, really enjoyed that. So this is a really tough question. Uh, my honest answer is among the many questions that kind of, among the many kind of flashpoints between Protestants and, and Catholics and Orthodox uh, that there are to investigate, this just hasn't been at the top of my list. So I've interviewed people on it, done a little bit of reading. I, I would kind of remain like agnostic insofar as I just want to say like I haven't done enough reading on this I, I really I understand the basic arguments um I actually have like I, I've talked before about my note-taking system I have an ongoing note about arguments for and against various positions and I was working on my uh, apocrypha one recently and so you know I think there really are good arguments both ways I think 
the argument that like Luther essentially just ripped books out of the Bible that were always there. I, I really don't think that's the best argument. I think we see, you know, Catholics who are contemporary to Luther that also don't hold the Apocrypha to be scripture. Uh, so I, I think it's not as simple to say that it was decided in the 380s uh, at the kind of North African and councils of Hippo, Carthage, Rome, I think we've got going on there, um, the various councils there, and that, you know, no no one ever thought of it again until Luther comes by like a bull in a china closet and rips it out. I just, I just don't think that's the case. I think there's kind of medieval evidence and late medieval, early modern evidence to show that it was, it was a little complicated right before the Council of Trent. Um, so that makes me kind of pause before being too dogmatic about it either way. Um, but yeah, the short answer is it's something I, I'd have to study more, but it's not that it's not interesting. It just hasn't been at the top of my list, and there's only so much time. Okay. This is going to get me canceled. What's my most theologically progressive view? <sighs> um... I don't know that this is, so I once shared this view with my college roommate, which I probably shouldn't have done because he was a freshman at the time and it really scandalized him. Um, but here's maybe like my hottest take. But I don't, I don't think it's actually that crazy. You just have to hear me out for a second. I don't think most Christians believe in hell. That's probably my most theologically progressive view. Now, hear me out. Hear me out before you unsubscribe and you thumbs down and you say mean things in the chat. What I didn't say is that I don't, that I'm a universalist or I don't believe in hell. What I mean when I say that I don't think most Christians believe in hell is that if you accept the idea that belief is not simply intellectual assent, but belief can be kind of reverse engineered by our behavior, I don't think most people live as though a real place called hell of eternal conscious torment exists. Um, so, again, if you accept the idea that we can uh, determine one's beliefs from one's actions, I just, I don't tend to think that most of us live like the majority of the human race is going to hell, that like our neighbors, that maybe people in our family uh, are going to hell. Because often in Christian circles, we really kind of ridicule those like street preachers who are like doom and gloom. And I agree that like it's probably not the best method. But I think just how like dismissive of them we are and the fact that we're not doing more to tell people like you are about to burn in hell forever probably says something about like the level of our actual belief in that idea because i think that's probably the most consistent thing to do is to like tell everyone you can as often as you can um and maybe you find ways to nuance that so there's a little more tact right but i think we would be way more focused on it um if we had this like truly functional view of this I don't necessarily know what to do with this idea um, because I do think that by and large, like the biblical evidence does point to the existence of hell. Um, you know, I think, dare we hope? I, I think we all seem to hope um, whether we say we should or not. Um, but yeah, that's probably my most theologically progressive view. Hopefully you didn't all just cancel me because of that. Um, but there you go. Yeah, my roommate though was was shook when I said that. And, and then he always referred to me as his universalist roommate, which isn't true. Um, I digress. Okay. Angela asks, have you ever done a holy hour with the Eucharist? Um, I, I would say probably not. Um, so I, you know, I did spend an hour in prayer once in a Catholic chapel, um, where the Eucharist is present, but I don't think that's what Catholics mean by doing a holy hour with the Eucharist. Like it wasn't uh, specifically at a time for Eucharistic adoration. Um, yeah. Okay. This is a great question. Um, so captured by Anna Marie asks, what church uh, father's books do you recommend? Well, the ones I recommend the most are the ones I read with my patron book club. Okay, that's terrible. Annoying. Um, but seriously, right now, I would recommend the one we're reading. Um, but that's just kind of coincidence. You don't actually have to become a patron. Um, but I, I would start with the Apostolic Fathers. Um, it's a collection about yay wide. Um, I think people say it's like roughly the length of the New Testament. 
ish. Um, like in this edition with, you know, footnotes and everything, it's under 300 pages. But basically these are the writings uh, from like the time of Christ to about one, well, dating these things is hard, but let's say around like 150 AD or so. Um, so it, it's the earliest writings we have and well, why not start at the beginning? Um, but if you want to go from there, you know, go to the popular patristic series. Uh, it's going to be much cheaper than getting like the anti-Nicene fathers or the Nicene fathers, the ones in that binding. Of course, you could just get them like for free online. Um, but the popular patristic series has great selections. Um, you know, some really good ones there. If you're, I, I really like On Social Justice uh, by by St. Basil because it's challenging in more of like a pastoral and practical way. Um that kind of balances the headiness of the way a lot of people approach the church fathers. Um, yeah, but the catechetical lectures that you've got of various figures uh, are, are great places to start as well, just see kind of what the early church was teaching. But I would say start with the apostolic fathers, you know, and then just go where your interest leads you from there. So if you're if you're interested in like practical questions about wealth and poverty or social justice or, you know, various things like that, read those. If you're interested in the Holy Spirit or if you're interested in kind of catechesis, read those texts whatever's fun to you um don't get discouraged if some of it's hard uh you know bounce around see what you can do okay donald shelton asks um where are you doing your master's at what is your degree program uh, so i'm doing my master's at saint john's college in annapolis uh it's a master's in liberal arts with a focus in philo philosophy and theology um it's a great books program so we cover uh, there's five segments and you choose four of the five so there's mathematics and natural science uh history, politics and society, theology and philosophy, and literature. Um, the one I'm dropping is math and natural science. And then uh, you can either take it without a focus in which you do your electives in all of those, or you do a focus in which you do all of your electives in one, and you can write a master's thesis in that one. Uh, so I've chosen to do that. Um, yeah, it, it's a great books program. So for instance, right now, like in the history program, in all the programs, you essentially do like a classical track and then more of like a continental track. So for history, we did um, Herodotus, Thucydides, um, Tacitus, uh, and then like Gibbon um, for the, the Annals of Imperial Rome. Am I missing any in there? I feel like I am. Oh, Plutarch. Yes. Uh, so like the Greek and Roman historians, right? And then, and like the more continental track, I guess, it's also kind of the more like theory side of it. Uh, we started with Augustine, but then we went to John Battista Vico, uh, who's a kind of Italian philosopher. Um, and it's all about kind of like philosophy of history. So we read City of God to think about like methods of thinking about history. Jean Battista Vico is the new science, uh, which is all about kind of like the course of nations and the pattern they follow. Then we read Immanuel Kant, uh, Hegel, and now we're in Marx. We'll go to Nietzsche, Heidegger, Husserl. Yeah, might be missing some in there. Um, but so that's kind of the, the flavor of that. Uh, when we get into theology and philosophy, we'll do like Aristotle, um, but then also scripture and uh, some of the, the early fathers as well. So yeah, kind of the classics, if you will. All right, uh, we'll probably go for another 15 minutes or so, um, but uh, yeah. Mary C., I read the Apocrypha was not taken out of Protestant Bibles until after 1800. Is that true? Um, to the best of my understanding, you have, at first, the Apocrypha moved to an appendix in the Protestant Bible. So that's what we see happening with Luther, and that's kind of followed after him, where the Apocrypha is technically, like, in the Bible, insofar as it's between the leather covers of the Bible, right? Um, but it's bracketed off as, you know, good for reading, but not at the same level as inspired scripture. Um, and then it does seem that in the 1800s, um, or maybe even later, I don't know, um, but basically for, like, cost reasons it becomes more cost effective to print it without the appendices right and, and so you take them out uh, so it is more of a modern phenomenon to not have them in there in any capacity to the best of my understanding i'd love to know someone was saying ha 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 lol um hopefully i said something that was genuinely funny um always better to be laughed with than at but you know uh that's okay um All right, questions, questions, questions. Um, okay, Isaiah Langenfeld. Isaiah Langenfeld, open question. What are your thoughts on Protestant retrieval and renewal efforts such as Gavin Ortland, Matthew Barrett, Brandon Smith, Center for Baptist Renewal, etc.? Okay, 
So first plug is that I just, oh no, I not Matthew Barrett. Um, other one from Center Baptist Renewal, uh, Dr. Matthew Emerson. Yeah, I just interviewed him. That'll be out soon. Uh, so for like Baptist Retrieval, um, Matthew Barrett. I've tried to get him on a couple times, unsuccessfully, um, alas. But, uh, and obviously big fan of Gavin. Um, so I think it's good. Like I, I think Protestants should try to retrieve and um, retrieve the tradition as much as they can. Um, you know, I think in so doing, some of those Protestants who do that will become Catholic or Orthodox because their their way of looking at the tradition will end up giving the tradition kind of maybe more weight than where they started. And once you kind of have that shift of the relative importance of tradition vis-a-vis -vis scripture, et cetera, um, you're kind of bound to become Catholic or Orthodox. Um, but I also think it's perfectly reasonable for Protestants to want to kind of be better informed by the tradition, even if they might say, we're not going to take it on as an equal authority. Um, and, you know, we're going to recognize that we do disagree with it, um, but, you know, try to learn from it. So, you know, I think where Protestants sometimes get into a little bit of trouble is kind of assuming that um, they're going to be able to go back to the early church and they're actually going to find that it was Baptist or that, you know, and that it was this or that. I tend to think it was kind of complicated, um, but also like, to be consistent as a Protestant, there are certain things that you're going to have to say, like the, the church did this for a long time and we don't do it. And, and we think it's good not to do it, even though the church did it for a long time. And so, you know, those efforts are going to be limited in that way. Um, but as long as people know that, I think it's fine. I, I don't think it's wrong to kind of retrieve some of the practices and not others as a Protestant. Um, if you're, you know, continuing Sola Scriptura, uh, as your framework, but you want to be more historically for informed, um, I think that's a fine thing to do. So yeah, I I'm all for it. I think it's good. Um, yeah. Someone said, oh, was that in hardcover? If that was the anti-Nicene Fathers. I can never remember that this is mirrored. Um, yes, I was gifted them though. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Mary C said, be ready to be really challenged, less change after you read on social justice. The profile picture is different here, but if this is the same Mary C that's a, a patron, uh, yeah, we read it together. And it is the most challenging book I've read uh, in terms of like a conviction level. Okay. Uh, thoughts on annihilationism. Um, not settled on the question. Um, I, I wouldn't consider it like a uh, an out of bounds position by any means. Um, I think, you know, if we if we were to use the language of Dr. Gavin Ortland, uh, if we were to talk about like theological triage um, here and we were to rank the relative importance of this doctrine, you know, whether you hold to like eternal conscious torment or annihilationism, I really think that's something that we can debate. Um, I tend to lean towards it. I, I'll be honest. I just, I have a hard time with eternal conscious torment. Um, it kind of goes back to my comments of, I don't think people functionally believe in it, but uh, be because of that, like I also struggle to functionally believe that. Um, not that annihilationism makes it a whole lot better, um, but in terms of the character of God and in terms of um, some of the language of scripture, I think it's a, it's a decent reading. Um, I don't hold to it like dogmatically insofar as I think people have to be annihilationist or people are terrible or they're making God a moral monster or anything like that. Um, but I'd, I'd say a shade towards it. Peter Dragonov, are you ever afraid that you're going to settle for less than God wants for you, whether in virtue or in the certainty you have about doctrine? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, well, so there's two questions here. Um, well, I guess three, really. Um, so are you ever worried that you're going to settle for less than God wants for you? I would say yes to that all the time. Like, I think the great, the great temptation is, is complacency, right? And um, especially for theologically minded people, I think the great temptation tends to be to just make theology a matter of the head and, and to forget that, like, we are talking about the salvation of souls. We are talking about, um, 
the the good news of the gospel, news that brings hope and healing to the world, that really is a life changing message, right? Like, I think my temptation is just to drown myself in books um, because I, I like to play with ideas. I think people who are drawn to theology or philosophy, they're drawn to it because they like to play with abstract ideas and maybe they have some kind of facility at it. And so they have fun thinking about concepts um, and concepts are good and they can be edifying, but they should be in service to our faith and service to the church. And so, yeah, I'm always, um, you know, in some ways worried about kind of settling for less. Um, and I think we've made Christianity really easy in, in the modern West. Like we don't make it ask much of us. And I think that that's a dangerous thing. Um, so I would say that's probably more in the virtue side. Um, and the certainty I have about doctrine, I honestly, I don't worry about this as much as I used to. Um, I, I tend to think that certainty isn't something we really have um, in, in theology. Now, that's going to sound like more liberal than I mean it. But like for, philosophically, I think certainty is a super high bar. I think what we can have is maybe like a level of assurance, a level of confidence, you know, a level of like, I trust that this is the case. Um, but certainty, I, I just don't know that that's the bar I'm chasing anymore. Um, so I don't worry about that as much. Okay. Other than the Holy Land, where overseas would you like most like to visit? Um, I mean, I really would like to visit the Holy Land. I don't know that'd be at the top of my list or not. Um, I mean, in terms of like its you know, theological significance, it's great. Um, just in terms of like beautiful places, I really want to do a Scandinavian trip. Um, my wife and I did Iceland for our honeymoon, and I thought that was gorgeous. And I would love to do like Norway, Sweden, etc. I think that would be really fun. Uh, but Asia is the only inhabited continent uh, that i haven't been to and so i really do want to make it to like thailand or bali um i think those would be really cool i love the beach um but i think like japan would be super cool too um so i want to get to asia to say like i've been to all of them um but i do think the scandinavian countries are just beautiful they kind of fit my my temperament in a lot of ways i think and uh yeah okay um wow getting close to eight, probably call it soon, but, um, let's see. What are your thoughts on the rosary and the testimonies of people who claim the rosary led to miracles from God? Um, so first thoughts on the rosary, uh, this gets me in trouble with my Protestant friends as well. Um, kind of like my thoughts on icons, I think understood correctly. Um, the asking of, of saints for intercession is, is theologically licit. Um, I think it's a theological development, um, but I think, you know, understood correctly and not abused, I think that's a fine thing. Um, I think in terms of the idea that um, we can ask other people to pray for us, right? Okay, check. Uh, ask other living people. Okay, so those who are dead are alive in Christ. We believe in that. Yes, okay, check. So could we ask them for their prayers for us? I don't see why we couldn't. Um you know, the questions of the extent to which they hear them, how all of that works, um, and why we would want to at times, you know, over and against praying directly to God. Okay, fine. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything theologically wrong with it under that understanding. I think maybe the, you know, the arguments that you'll hear would be something like, well, Christianity is a revealed religion, and it, that mode of prayer is not revealed to us, so we shouldn't do that. Yeah, um, I get that. I, I do tend to think of now, again, this is the video I recorded today that I'm still uncertain about, but theology as a science um, that that we can kind of, you know, work with the data we have and then come to conclusions from there. And I think what I just outlined, you know, isn't that big of a hop, skip, or jump. Um, so I'm fine with people praying the rosary. Um, the Divine Mercy Chaplet is part of my prayer life, uh, which includes uh, Hail Mary at the beginning. Um, so I'm fine with that. Um, but... W so, yes, fine with the rosary. Uh, what do I say to people who claim the rosary led to miracles from God? So something I need to personally work on my own life is I recognize just, like, how often I live like a skeptic uh, in terms of these things. Like, that I, I'm not intellectually a cessationist. Um, I, I'm a continuationist. I, you know, I believe in that. Um, but I do find myself, like, my knee-jerk reaction to things like that is more often skepticism than not. But I think that's more a problem with me than that. Um, that being said, I think there's probably exaggeration there. Um... But could it happen? Uh, sure. Why not? 
I get people telling me like I need to look into like Marian apparitions or Eucharistic miracles. Um, I don't generally find that to be like the most convincing evidence, but I'm also not saying like these things can't happen. It it just doesn't really factor in that much to my kind of consideration of which tradition. So yeah, but I think you know generally it's probably better for our faith to have a more expansive view of God's activity in the world. So, um, okay. Jacob Emmanuel. Okay. Question. Thoughts on the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Do you think it's true that only the original autographs were inerrant and that all subsequent copies of scripture are in fact errant? Okay. So first of all, I don't think that's what something like the Chicago statement means. Um, Chicago statement is kind of like the, the gold standard, I guess, in at least evangelical circles for uh, the doctrine on inerrancy. What I, what I mean by that is it, it's saying that, you know, the the confession or the the, doc, uh, the statement only applies the word inerrancy to the original autographs because like that would be, you know, if God is inspiring the authors and the authors are writing it, we're only going to say that for sure that the original autographs are because, you know, copies to mistakes definitely do happen. Like if we look into manuscript history, like mistakes in terms of this one says this word, this one says the other, like something went wrong there, they happen. Um, but it's not necessarily saying that all manuscripts are therefore errant. Like, it's just saying that they're not all protected from error in the same way. Um, so they, you know, if they faithfully copied it down, they would share from that same inerrancy. Um, and this is important because people who are drafting the Chicago Statement, like, they want to say the Bible's inerrant. Now, if pressed, technically, they're going to say the original autographs. But they're saying, insofar as our Bibles today faithfully represent those, like, they're inerrant, too. Um, so they're not trying to just say, like, inerrancy, you know, means nothing. Because if that was the case, that all others are errant, and, like, we, then it becomes kind of, like, an, a non-issue. Because we don't have the original autographs. So it's just, like, you know, a uh, hypothetical type of idea. Um so that, just comment. Um, but my thoughts on it in general. Um, I'm fine signing a statement that like the Bible is inerrant. I think the Bible is our, um, is our infallible rule of faith. Um, I think the Bible is kind of our best arbiter for truth. Um, I think the Bible is true. Um, the reason I somewhat bristle at the term inerrancy is just because I think it gets you mired down into debates like this about the original autographs, um, about the definition of an error, that some somewhat for me just kind of miss the mark of what scripture is doing. I think scripture is trustworthy. I think scripture is true. I think scripture is our standard uh, for, for doctrine and for practice. Um, and so if we want to describe that as inerrant, I think, cool. Um, I think that's fine. And I understand why it's important to some people. To me, I just have tend my experience with inerrancy has been that it, it tends to just bring us further into debates and then we define it and define it and define it such that it does become what some have uh, said. I think it was Craig Olson uh, that said, like, it becomes this evangelical shibboleth. It's a gatekeeping word, like, just a test. Like, do you believe this? And it's like, yes, but like, people end up defining in different ways. Anyway, that was a bit of a rant. Um, okay, we are at eight. Let me uh, just go back through. Double check. Um, uh, if there's anything. Oh. Do you think all Christians should accept this proposition? The language of baptism saving is biblical. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Right? That, um, I, I think we do have that in scripture. Um and so I think then it just becomes an in what way, in what sense, is is it, how does that work? But I think, yeah, we can accept that. We just, we just then get into the real meat of the question, right? Um, which, you know, I think you could hold to a like, non-baptismal, I think Gavin Orland talks about this, um, where it, as it's kind of, um, what's the word for it? Um, metonymy that he uses, right? When you say like... Um, so Moscow and Washington are in um, 
locked in debate. Well, okay, you're using like a part to refer to the whole, right? Like Russia and the U.S. or anything. And so you, in the same way, like I'm not saying you have to take this view, but I think, you know, I'm saying everyone can accept it because you could take a view that, okay, baptism saves insofar as it's part of the larger work of, of faith. Um, so it's like, you know, repent and be baptized. The, the timing of that might be you were saved at faith and repentance, but baptism is an integral part of that whole process. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, I think everyone can do that. Okay. Um, okay, there's been a couple questions on this. Um, I'll probably make this my last one unless um, anything comes through. Um, I don't think there's been any like super chats that I missed, which is totally cool. Um, but okay. Uh, so the atonement, I've been reading on the different viewpoints of the atonement. Where do you sit on this issue? I tend to see, uh, soteriology, which is the study of salvation, uh, through the lens of union with Christ. So I wrote a paper on this. I've thought about putting on my academia.edu and putting more of my papers on there just in case people are curious about things I've written. Um, but basically, um, I think salvation is fundamentally, um, about being united to Christ, which fits well with atonement, because often this would be what's called an etymo etymological fallacy, but it actually is the case that atonement means at one meant, um, being made one with Christ. And so, you know, I think when we speak solely in terms of penal substitution, it can become too extrinsic. I think there are certainly penal, uh, I, I think there's certainly substitutional language in scripture and probably penal as well, but, um, I think it can become a bit one-sided. I think uh, Christus Victor in a similar way can become a bit one-sided, but I think what's fundamentally happening in salvation is that those who are once estranged are becoming united to God. That, that actually, I think, starts the incarnation, uh, that Christ kind of takes on humanity and he begins healing humanity from the inside out, uh, so that salvation begins at, in the womb and extends to the tomb. Uh, this just happened to rhyme, right? But like, his entire life is atoning, including his atoning death, his baptism. This is really important. Like, Paul brings this out, I think it's in Romans 6, that we're baptized with Christ. And so why is Christ baptized? So that being united to him, like our, we can participate in his baptism. Thus, there really is only one baptism, Christ's baptism. Our baptisms participate in that. Um, and so what does it mean to be saved? How does atonement work? Uh, it's being united to Christ. How do we become united to Christ? Okay, so this is an important question. Um, I tend to still take a, a Protestant viewpoint on this. I actually think Calvin is wonderful here. Calvin gets a lot of shtick from people. I know Matt Fred actually put up a post. I don't know if it was today. I saw it today of like a statue of uh, Calvin with a thumbs down kind of thing. Look, there's reasons people don't like Calvin. Um, I'd wager that a lot of people who don't like Calvin haven't actually read Calvin. Um, but some, but you can read Calvin and not like him too. Um, but I do think he's right that, that faith grasps Christ. Um, that as long as Christ is apart from us, all the... The benefits of salvation remain apart from us. This is uh, book three, section one. Um, and so that fundamentally, uh, the problem is being united to Christ. How do we become united to Christ? It is through faith. Faith unites us to Christ. Um, and that is how we are saved. Wow. Started to sound like a preacher there at the end. Um, okay. Well, union with Christ. That's probably the best place uh, to end this. Um. Oh, okay. Someone, I'll never stop if I just uh, stop seeing. Uh, okay, but this is an important question. So I'll end here. Uh, as tempting as union with Christ was. As the wheeling dragon. Did you see my question earlier? I asked about people. I asked your opinion on people with disabilities in ministry. Just curious. I know some churches tend not to include people with disabilities. Um Uh, I don't want to make a blanket statement here. I was going to say, I think that's a terrible thing to not include people with disabilities. Um, and if it's just because they have disabilities, I think that, that would be terrible. And it sounds like that's what's at fault here, but I, you know, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. So um, yeah, I think that Christians um, have, all people have so much to learn from people uh, with, with disabilities, if that's the term we want to use. Um, and I, I think the idea that that would be a disqualification from serving uh, would would just be would be tragic. Now, I think there are certain serving roles in churches that require certain abilities, right? Um, and so if there was something like, 
Um, I'm trying to think even like, um, let's just say something silly, right? Like, uh, lighting of the candles in a Catholic church when you have to use one of those, like, um, I don't know, they're like poles and you light it and you put the candles out, right? They're, cause they're really tall. Um, if you're not tall enough to do that, if you're not physically capable of holding one, then in that case, okay. So if you can't carry out the task, then it makes sense that someone can't serve in that way. But I think, I think that often in Protestant circles, we tend to over-intellectualize things so much that the gospel becomes a really just a matter of like understanding lectures and that it sounds like maybe in this case, people could be barred from serving because maybe their intellectual capacity is not at the same level and they can't kind of like repeat a TED talk in the same way. And I think that is just a wrong conception. And I think that within the, the family of Christ, within the within the church, we we really need to have space for for all the, the members of the of the body of Christ, um, with, with various abilities. And so I know, that, you know personally, there's, there's so much to learn from people, um, who, who have had a just vastly different life experience for me. And that can encompass a lot of things, including having, uh, disabilities. So I, I think it's something that we need to think more about probably, um, how, how to incorporate that better into the church. Cause I think it's sad that fortunately, um, people with disabilities are probably often overlooked by the church. Um, and, and I think that's a, a shameful thing. Hopefully that answers your question, the wheeling dragon. Um, okay. Um, hopefully, yeah. Okay. We could talk about it more. Happy to talk about it more, uh, sometime, but I think that's it. Uh, Eliza told me that I do need to make sure to get some rest at some point today. I have a tendency to fail to do that. So I think that's what I'm going to do been watching avatar the last airbender on netflix you can judge me for that just started watching it last night i think it's really fun uh so i'm probably gonna go do that i hope you all have a great night thank you for tuning in if you enjoy these live q a's do let me know they're a fun thing to do um for me at least i hope it's been helpful and god bless i'll see you next time